filter diffuse galaxies. I'm going to go into more detail on that. Um, so uh, some work from a lot of different projects, so a lot of different collaborators made this possible. I've underlined uh, people who are here today in case you in case you want to talk to somebody besides me about this work. I think that'll be all right. I'm going to do that instead. <clears throat> so um, what I'm going to try to do is do a very brief overview of uh, basic properties of UDGs, not time to review the entire field, but um, try to give you a snapshot of some of the, the fundamental properties that are maybe uh, not really addressed through a lot of the theoretical models yet. There's been a lot of work, uh, nice work recently from a lot of different sides on, on reproducing ultra diffuse galaxies. They tend to focus on them as low surface brightness dwarfs, and there turned out to be lots of ways to make low surface brightness dwarfs. Um, which is interesting, but it doesn't maybe address all the properties of some of the most interesting UDGs. So here's a, uh, an overview of the, how these things are defined. This is uh, effective radius versus luminosity. And this is uh, for old stellar systems. We've got the, the dwarfs to the giants here, and the UDGs stick out as the sort of tendril. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't anything on either side of that. That's the way these things were found and selected. So these things uh, have the sizes of a, an L-star galaxy, some of them, and but the luminosities of, of a dwarf. <coughs> so they're discovered uh, by Peter van Dockum in the Coma Cluster 2015 and collaborators. Doesn't mean that some of these weren't found before, but they were first recognized as this very pervasive population a few years ago. Some of the basic properties is these are not disturbed, disrupting systems. They seem to be pretty well relaxed. Cirsic indices of one or a little less. Um, Red sequence, old quiescent spheroidal triaxial prolate type objects, at least in the coma cluster. There are, uh, there's a lot of work done on what's also called UDGs in the field that are blue and star forming low surface brightness dwarfs that fit in the same part of parameter space, but it's not clear those are at all the same objects. There's more than one way to end up as a low surface brightness galaxy. So there's some work to be done to see if there's, those are actually connected populations. So um, as we'll continue to hear today, there are ways to make low surface brightness dwarfs like UDG. So the question is, is this now a solved problem? And one basic way you can think of making these is you start off with a massive galaxy cluster with a really thick ISM. You drop something in with gas and it gets tidally stripped and ram pressure stripped. And you get something that's a, a, a low surface brightness star forming dwarf that becomes a low surface brightness quench dwarf. Okay, end of story. I'll call this the vanilla recipe. We'll talk about some different recipes for making UDGs. Okay, so this is sort of low surface brightness dwarfs, fall into a cluster, turn into um, red low surface brightness dwarfs, maybe with some extra effect from having high spins. And a lot of different papers that have explored this, and I think the talk after me will talk about this some more. And I'm sure this must be happening at some level. Um, we can see it happening. There's an example in the Perseus cluster that we're working on. But is this the only way to make a UDG? Is there more than one way to, to get a low surface brightness dwarf? Um, here's uh, so what I'm going to do is kind of try to present a lot of the latest results uh, that are providing some new clues and show this isn't quite a solved problem. This is one of the fr Hubble Frontier fields. These are ultramassive clusters, um, intermediate redshift. And this is work by uh, Steve Anson's at Toronto. We published a paper a couple of years ago on the first one of these. We now have six of them. So what you can see, these red dots, if you can see them, are UDGs in this cluster. This is a one megaparsec scale. First thing you might see is that they're missing around the center. As you might expect, if these are fragile, relatively fragile object compared to a BCG and are disrupted. So in these high, high mass clusters, you're, you're missing, uh, within 10% of the viral radius, you're missing your UDGs, probably tidally disrupted. But the next thing you might see, if, if you're sitting close enough, is that there's a lot more of them on that side than that side, which is not something we were looking for at all. It just jumped out from the data. So here's, maybe you can see it a little more clearly, the positions of these things marked and trying to determine the statistical significance of these things as you know, chance fluctuations or not, um, making a dividing line that divides the, the asymmetry here. And it turns out uh, this is a highly significant lopsidedness. And out of the six frontier field clusters, Five of them have a high, highly significant lopsidedness here. So that's uh, uh, hot off the press. Um, you should see this soon in, in, on the archive, but um, uh, we're, I don't know what to make of this. We're not really sure, except that it may be some association with the 
cluster assembly. These are all actively ascending, assembling clusters. And is it possible that some of the clusters have higher UDG fractions than others, some kind of biasing in the formation sites in the early universe? So if anybody has ideas on this, please let me know. We have no idea what's going on here. <clears throat> so uh, again, UDGs were discovered in clusters, but are they specific to clusters? Well, the clusters are easy way to find a bunch of galaxies at once, but it turns out now people are looking, they find them everywhere, except the local group, we haven't found one yet. Um, this is a scaling relation from a lot of observational results, including our frontier field data that pins down the high mass end. To a first approximation, the number of UDGs scales linearly with host halo mass. So it's not at all a cluster-specific phenomenon. They're actually found in the field as well, even quenched ones. So there's some sort of universal formation mechanism that clusters, processes contribute something to UDGs, but um, as, uh, um, as also in, the, in the, t the work that Jonathan mentioned with, with Nihau, there you can get a pre-processing forming UDGs before they even fall into clusters. So something's going on that makes these um, low surface brightness dwarfs probably from internal processes. Just to give you an idea of the numbers of these, this is an observational uh, compilation of the number density per megaparsec, really low number density. So these are very interesting, but overall they're a small fraction of the, of the galaxies in the universe. So um, if you're making lots of UDGs in your models, that's maybe not a good sign. They're interesting, but they're not pervasive in, in, in a sense relative to normal galaxies. So as we already heard um, about the Nihau simulations is one way to have a universal formation mechanism that works in all environments through this internal feedback mechanism. Um, you can get something that is temporarily quenched uh, in between, or looks uh, quiescent in between feedback uh, episodes. And I'll call this the chocolate chip recipe. It's kind of a, a little different uh, from a, you know, just a vanilla recipe. It's this extra twist, extra ingredient of the internal feedback. So uh, these are all u presenting UDG just as normal dwarfs, these couple of scenarios I mentioned. And uh, <clears throat> what are some predictions there from these scenarios? One is that UDG should uh, unless they're in a cluster, sh it should always be a young or intermediate age. Uh, these are dwarfs. They shouldn't be able to shut off their star formation. And they should still have gas hanging around. They should have some sort of disk uh, residual morphologies and kinematics. Their halo masses should be like normal dwarfs, stellar populations like normal dwarfs. Okay. And these are all things we can test. And also, this is kind of a, a, an odd prediction of, of some of the models is that um, you get lots and lots of UDGs, and the, instead of the UDGs being the tail of the normal dwarf distribution, it's, it's the other way around. Um, we heard about that yesterday from, about fire and Nihau producing mostly UDGs with normal dwarfs. Um, I can't go through this in detail, but there's the, the observed relation here, and most of the UDGs sit uh, simulated galaxies sit above the sizes of the normal dwarfs. So, okay, what else might be going on here? What could we learn about UGGs observationally? And one of the, the best clues is globular clusters. Well, people uh, like our group have been working on globular clusters for years and it really jumped out at us. Um, here's a couple of pictures, globular clusters circled. You can see them by eye here. These things have tons of clusters relative to their stellar mass. So some of these examples, you've got something that's a two times 10 to the eight luminosity, 100 times fainter than the Milky Way, yet only about half as many globular clusters as the Milky Way. So that's a really startling difference from a normal dwarf or normal galaxies should give us a clue. And these are well-studied things because they're the more luminous ones, but some of the really faint ones that are hard to study, you can almost not see the stars. They're, they're so uh, populated by globular clusters. So up to a quarter of the stellar mass today is in globular clusters, and if you consider various disruption effects over a cosmic time, you could have 100% of their stars associated with globular cluster formation at some higher redshift. And think of these as possibly pure stellar halo galaxies that never form the normal uh, the normal stellar populations. So I'll call this uh, um, half-baked, <laughs> this in honor of Santa Cruz, I thought we would uh, call it that. So these are, are, are literally half-baked galaxies. They haven't completed forming all their regular components. Okay, so one of the interesting things about globular clusters that's not yet understood, again, we saw something about this yesterday, is that observationally, the number of globulars or the mass of the globular cluster system scales very nicely with the halo mass. I think we might hear some more about that from Andy tomorrow or today. Um, and that's both done in sort of using an abundance matching type method, but also individual galaxy by galaxy basis. So this is not understood. Um, and I, I can't really talk about that now, but if you just blindly apply that method to these ultra diffuse galaxies and say, 
the same scaling holds for them as for any other galaxy, then here's what you get. Here's the inferred halo mass, there's a the stellar mass. These shaded regions are sort of standard uh, abundance matching methods. Um, and here's where the UDGs in coma lie. There's some of them that are in the expected zone, but at least half of them are overmassive, if you believe what the globular clusters are telling us. So uh, order of magnitude, more dark matter for quite a few of them. So we call these overmassive halos. So this is telling us that we heard earlier how it's, uh, there could be a lot of scatter at, the, at lower halo masses, say below 10 to the 10, but this is up at 10 to the 11 halo mass, which is maybe not where we're expecting this kind of stochasticity, if it's true. Okay, so what would be kind of a, a, a toy model? We don't have a good, really detailed model of how this might happen, but just to go show you a toy model of this, this is a halo mass growth curve, say for a, um, you know, a M33 type object today, but what, ha what would happen if you just stop star formation for some reason at redshift of three? Okay, you might get something that looks like a UDG. And then you continue to grow your, your dark matter, um, and the star formation stops shortly after globular clusters form, or the metal poor globular clusters, and you get what we call a failed galaxy. Now, I know there's a lot of talk in the literature in, in the first papers on this topic. It was talking about failed Milky Way, and people um, will kind of focus in on that idea. It's pretty extreme, and I think that would only be for maybe a couple of very extreme galaxies, but even that's probably a little extreme. But you don't have to have a failed Milky Way to have a failed galaxy. These are still, could be 10 times overabundant in dark matter without uh, being a failed Milky Way. Okay, so the predictions of this model is that they're, they're old, including in the field, enhanced in alpha elements like globular clusters, gas poor, overmassive dark matter halos, and overpopulous globular cluster systems. Okay, some of those predictions are, of course, reverse engineered because that's what the observations are saying. So I want to talk quite a bit about some new observations we have. There's been a lot of observational work done in UDGs, including spectroscopy. But there's this wonderful new instrument that's come online on Keck called the Keck Cosmic Web Imager, k -E i and it's really uh, designed for this kind of work of low surface brightness uh, spectroscopy. So here is a, a, a famous Dragonfly 44 galaxy in, in coma. There's the original HST image. Here's a reconstructed image from KCWI after 17 hours of exposure time. And you have to do a lot of work with sky subtraction. Um, about eight hours on sky on this one, signal noise of 100 overall, which means you can start doing more than getting a single measurement. You can do resolve measurements. Um, here's a part of the spectrum. You can see that the black is the, the, the data and, and the, the red is the model fit. So really exquisite data to, to determine kinematic stellar populations of these galaxies. So here's the kinematics. Um, showing one slice, this is IFU data, so you can do this in different ways, but here's a 1D slice along the major axis of uh, mean velocity, so we're looking like for a rotation curve, and we don't see one. It's basically consistent with zero. Okay, so that's, uh, for this galaxy, doesn't look like a high spin dwarf that just kind of faded. And of course, yeah, you know, from one galaxy, it's gonna be hard to, to rule out an entire scenario. But um, here's another way of looking at it. V over sigma versus ellipticity. This is a, uh, these oblate isotropic rotator models. And we're comparing here with data from uh, a symbol by coral Wheeler of normal dwarfs in the local group. The high mass dwarfs are these larger symbols, so those are maybe the fairest comparison with the UDG. And um, there's a quite a spread. Uh, overall, they're fairly fast rotating, uh, uh, but uh, rotation supported. A few of them like this, uh, like this UDG. And I think we don't quite understand what's going on for these local group dwarfs as well. So what about velocity dispersion? Here's a 2D map where the, the blue to the red shows you uh, colder to hotter velocity dispersion. So the velocity dispersion is rising with radius. Here's what a 1D profile looks like. So this rising velocity dispersion with radius like local group dwarf spheroidals, but um, a higher, much higher mass and much farther out. That's a log scale here. Okay, so one of the first things you'd like to do with this kind of data is do dynamical models, find out what we can learn about the internal mass and structure. This is work led by Asher Wasserman is a st student here. I'm going to be graduating this year. And uh, these are two alter alternative models here. Uh, this is a NFW model. This is a cord model based on the, the Nihau parameterization for a core. And the bad news is that even with these exquisite data, we can't really determine a lot about the dark matter halo. You could get either one to work. Although with the data, you can start making some constraints. You say, okay, if you do have an NFW, a custody halo, you require a very tangential anisotropy in order to fit the data, which maybe is, is um, 
surprising, and it's something you could also look for in simulations. An isotropic model will give you a, a chord galaxy. And then once you assume one of those halo models, then you could get the, uh, what halo masses are consistent with it. Again, very large error bars on there. Unfortunately, we can't rule out anything at this point, which also means we um, can't rule out this, this uh, failed galaxy scenario. So here again is the halo mass stellar mass relation. And for this galaxy, here's the standard, standard relation here. Uh, for the cusp model, or the core model, which I think would be our favorite model, you could go anything from the normal relation up to the 10 times over, over massive still. So unfortunately, we haven't found a direct way yet to get uh, uh, de definitive results on a single galaxy, but I'd like to turn this around and, and plead with the theorists to give ob ob observables, things like velocity dispersion, things that we can measure for a large sample, and rather than trying to infer the halo mass for individual objects, let's go forward modeling and see what the simulators tell us about a sort of a fundamental plane type observations. Okay, we also heard earlier about uh, fuzzy dark matter, and um, we, we looked at this also with this, this data set. Um, I'm gonna, for the sake of time, I think I'm gonna skip through this, but the, the bottom line is that fuzzy dark matter creates a central soliton bump, so our hope was that we might be able to detect that, which would be really exciting, and we don't see anything obvious like that. Um, the, the increasing particle mass will give you a different type of uh, soliton bump. This is, again, work led by Asher Wasserman. And it turns out you can fit the, the velocity dispersion profile with either a CDM halo or a fuzzy dark matter halo. So again, we can't rule either one out, but what you can do is play the game and say, okay, let's assume that fuzzy dark matter is correct theory and say, what, what do you infer about the particle mass? And this, this broad histogram is, is our permitted particle mass here, which agrees with what you get from local group dwarf spheroidals. And like those dwarf spheroidals, it disagrees with the uh, large-scale structure constraints, although you know, there's, there's always some loopholes with those kind of constraints. So this is not um, really a, a new result in terms of uh, uh, new constraints, except for it's a different, a different uh, location, different type of galaxy. We've not been able to look at this before. So let me uh, finish by talking about stellar populations. Um, and uh, this is work led by Alexa Viam, also a grad student here finishing this year, using the state-of-the-art full spectral fitting code called ALF, where it's fitting de uh, not only in, in wavelength space, but it's fitting detailed abundances um, where we have them. Um, in our wavelength range at these low for surface brightnesses uh, and signal noise are still a bit limited, so we can't get a lot of abundance patterns yet. Um, but here's some results. Now, this is very preliminary. Um, uh, but I wanted to, because of so many theorists in the room, I want to get people's ideas on this by showing this of what might be happening. So here's the, uh, the, the iron metallicity versus radius, and uh, I mainly focus on the black points. You see it's, it's very metal poor in the center and increasing to be less metal poor in the outer parts. And, uh, and there's an opposite correlation with magnesium over iron going down with, with, with radius. Um, and it seems to be an old system. It's hard to tell with horizontal branch effects. So this is, there's this very iron poor center and the magnesium is uh, fairly constant throughout the galaxy. So what could be causing this? Uh, another way to look at this, this is magnesium to iron plot. You'll see often in Milky Way stellar populations. So sort of POP1 is down here, uh, the MG or of, of of unity. And, uh, and there's enhanced population up here, which corresponds to the central two kiloparsecs, which is sort of globular cluster-like stellar population. So it looks like the center of this ultra-diffuse galaxy is like a globular cluster population, maybe is the zone where globular clusters were formed, and somehow it spread, it, uh, the star formation spread outward. So it's an inside-out galaxy formation. And uh, from what is known about normal dwarfs in the local group, that's the opposite. You tend to see uh, outside-in formation, younger metal-rich stellar populations in the center. Uh, simulations also produce the same thing, uh, everything I've seen. So this would be completely opposite to uh, everything we know about dwarf galaxy formation. Um, so I just want to put that out there and see if people have ideas about what's going on. Um, so that was this, this one galaxy where we've got exquisite data so far. Uh, there are uh, aperture, single aperture measurements done now on, on quite a few UDGs. And here's a plot, again, this uh, mass metallicity plot that we've seen before and showing the UDGs have a wide spread, some of them consistent with relation, quite a few that are below the relation. So it suggests there's this subset, a couple subsets of UDGs, maybe the vanilla type UDGs that follow the normal relations, just low surface brightness dwarfs that got quenched, but then there's these possible half-baked population down here that are metal poor. And not only metal poor, 
but uh, this is uh, but alpha enhanced. So again, you've got some over here that are pop one and some over here that are pop two. This kind of two populations. But more more than that, the first object we observed with KCWI was a surprise. So there's two cases metal rich, three cases half baked. This one called DGSAT one in the field, that's way up here. So it's a no known galaxy looks like that. Only a few rare halo stars in the Milky Way look like that. Mg over Fe greater than one and Iron, basically driven by the low iron abundance of like about around minus three. So we are uh, again scratching our heads over what to, where this comes from. Um, this could be, as we heard, that there's some expected coupling between feedback and metallicity. So it could be that the, um, I don't know what happened there, that the uh, formation of uh, the globular clusters went along with some severe, uh, extreme feedback episode, which, um, which produced a low iron abundance through various processes. So again, this is something we're, we're, we're puzzled about, and, but it seems to be part of the U UDG um, full picture. So I've run out of time to really talk about this other one, which is sort of more, more even more controversial, perhaps, than so these over, over massive dark matter halos, is there's now two objects we've found that have uh, no, consistent with having no dark matter. And um, you know, if you want, we could talk about the details of, of the observations. There's still a lot of controversy, but we've got repeat measurements, uh, two different groups now measuring. We've got two objects. We've got stars and globular clusters. The low velocity dispersion is not going away. That seems here to stay. The only controversy now has to do with the distance. And, um, and the good news is we now have HS, new HST data in hand, which will answer that question. So Shani Daniele is working on that. So. Um, Again, we, we really don't know how to explain these low dark matter galaxies. There seems to be a lot of spread in the properties. So let me, let me just close with um, this picture of we seem to have three types of UDGs, these normal dwarfs, low surface brightness, these half-baked galaxies, and this even more puzzling low dark matter systems. So I guess the overall model is uh, from Santa Cruz, we have a local model, keep Santa Cruz weird, and we'll say, Let's keep galaxies weird with UDGs. So a lot of weird properties that we would like to understand. So thanks for your attention. Questions? Could you clarify the system you showed with a positive metallicity gradient, uh, so lower metallicity? Was that a cluster Yes, it's, well, it's a cluster UDG, but um, it's the most well-studied one that been, Peter's been working on for, for years now called Dragonfly 44. Um, it's on the outskirts of the coma cluster, so although it's in the cluster, it's sort of on, a, on an early infall, it looks like, from based on the velocity, it seems to be associated with the group. So it's an example, we think of a pre-processed UDG, even though it's part of the coma cluster, it looks like it was a UDG before it fell in, even. So this is just a uh, fundamentalist question. So I. I have some sense of what a soliton is in condensed matter physics kind of context. And so what is this soliton bump? So you think of this as a boson where the, the, um, the particles are all uh, collected together. So they, they, they have this uh, large de Broglie wavelength that's a really low mass particle. So it's a wavelength of about a kiloparsec. So they sort of fill this region toward the center uh, of the galaxy. Um, you know, not too good on all the rest of the physics myself. Other people in the room are, are much better at this particular okay, topic. Thanks. Okay, thanks. There. There. So I'm wondering if you could uh, put together uh, some of, of the local group ways of measuring cores with um, Conway and Van Dockham semi-resolved stellar populations, given that you have, in this case, U U uh, UDG 44. Um, you, you look like you have two populations. Mm -hmm. One way people have done this, uh, I'm thinking Walker and Penarubia for the local group, is they've actually uh, used each population separately to get separate constraints on the slope. Because uh, you can get the mass inside with each one, and that's independent of anisotropy. So I'm thinking if you're in the semi-resolved regime, you might be able to do this by splitting the po populations with the surface brightness fluctuations to split out the spectra that way. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, it sounds really hard, but I, I get your point. Yeah, you could, um, you could do the full spectral fitting with two populations with different profiles. And it, yeah, I think that's doable. It sounds like hard work, but I think we could try that. Yeah, good, thanks. Yeah, so can you somehow summarize 
the business with the globular clusters, you, you thought that there might be three kinds of galaxies. The, the globular cluster populations vary amongst them, uh, and are globular clusters overabundant with respect to stars or halo mass or both? So the, the first two populations are um, low globular or normal globular cluster content and elevated globular cluster content, which go along with the dark matter fractions that go in lockstep according to this picture. The third population is the weirder one. These are the low dark matter galaxies. And at first glance, they look like they, have, they break the rules that they have a lot of globular clusters. So the scalar relations should say they have a lot of dark matter, not no dark matter. But then if you look at these in more detail, they're not normal globular clusters either. They all seem to be omega sin type objects, what we call ultra compact dwarfs. So, um, so that kind of technically goes with a scalar relation. If it's low globular clusters, they've just got this extra population of weird things. But um, again, we're not sure what to make of that. Okay, let's thank again to Aaron. Our 